Too many innocent people have been killed, including thousands of children. Far too many have been badly wounded. It's time to begin this new stage. For the hostages to come home, for Israel to be secure, for the suffering to stop. It's time for this war to end. That was President Biden on Friday calling on Hamas to agree to a ceasefire deal with Israel. White House National Security, Security Communication Advisor John Kirby joins us right now. John, thanks for joining us as always. Let, let's begin with that proposal the president laid out there uh, late this week. Uh, Israel has said that this was something they agreed to, but their conditions have not been met. Where does this stand exactly? Well, it is an Israeli proposal, one that they arrived at after uh, intense diplomacy with our own national security team and over at the State Department. Uh, in what, it is a phased approach, George. So where we are right now is that proposal, an Israeli proposal, has been given to Hamas. It was done on Thursday night, our time. We're waiting for a, an official response from Hamas. We would note that publicly Hamas officials came out and welcomed this proposal. And so what would uh, we hope would happen is they would agree to start phase one as soon as possible. And phase one would allow for some hostages, the elderly, sick, uh, women hostages to, to get out over a period of six weeks, no, no fighting, more humanitarian assistance in. And while that's all going on, the two sides would sit down and try to negotiate what phase two could look like and when that could begin. But based on what we're hearing from Prime Minister Netanyahu, are we in the situation now where if Hamas says yes, then Israel's going to say no? No, this was an Israeli proposal. We have every expectation that, that if uh, Hamas agrees to the proposal, as was transmitted to them, an Israeli proposal, that Israel would say yes. Again, well, all you get in, in, a, in a yes right now, George, and it's not, a, it's not a small thing, but what you get is the start of phase one. So you get some hostages coming out, initial hostages. You get some calm. You get some more humanitarian assistance, maybe up to 600 trucks. And then the two sides can start talking about phase two. Uh, so Prime Minister Netanyahu's team, in fact, his foreign minister, again, just said uh, that they welcome this, uh, th this announcement by the president and that they did, in fact, agree that this was their proposal. The president said Hamas is no longer capable of carrying out large-scale terror attacks. Is that based on new U.S. intelligence? And do the Israelis agree? It is based on accumulation of our own intelligence assessments across the intelligence agencies uh, that, militarily speaking, Hamas is in no position to conduct another attack like October 7th. Now, we're also not saying that Hamas has been wiped out off the face of the, the map. We've not said that uh, Hamas has no military capabilities. We've not said that they don't still represent a viable threat to the Israeli people. Of course they do. But they don't have the military capabilities to do what they did on the 7th of October. And so from a military perspective only, George. Uh, as President Biden said, the Israelis have accomplished mo almost uh, of their goals in Gaza. Let me ask you about Ukraine. President reversed his previous position and granted Ukraine permission to strike inside Russia with U.S. weapons. What prompted the switch? And are you worried that it's going to draw the U.S. into a direct conflict? That was the president's concern before. Uh, we've been concerned about escalation since the very beginning of this war, and those concerns uh, remain valid. Uh, the president has said uh, he does not want to be responsible for starting World War III. We're not looking for a conflict with Russia, another nuclear-armed power. That said, around the middle of May, the Ukrainians, faced with an incredible amount of pressure on Kharkiv, that town to the, in the north of Ukraine, not, not far from the Russian border, uh, they asked for some limited permission to use U.S.-supplied weapons against imminent threats just across the border. So we're talking about military emplacements, gun positions, that kind of thing, logistic staging bases that the Russians were using uh, to create some sort of buffer zone so that they could continue to pound Kharkiv. The president looked at that, talked to the interagency team, made sure he understood all the ramifications of the request, and then approved it. It is limited to the Kharkiv region, and it is limited with respect to the kinds of targets they can hit and how far back they can go. It was part of a pattern of, of the president refusing at first to, to provide Ukraine with certain munitions and permissions and then going along with it. Have those delays prolonged the war and put Ukraine in a tougher position? President Zelensky seems to suggest that. The delay that most prolonged this war and made things difficult was the delay in the Congress, George, uh, when we had a supplemental request submitted in October of last year, and for six months, Congress did nothing to get us the kinds of funding we needed to supply Ukraine. And for six months, basically, the Ukrainians got nothing from the United States, the biggest contributor of security assistance. In just the month or so since that supplemental was passed, I would remind you that we had submitted now five security assistance packages to Ukraine to get them the capabilities that they need. And 
And as for the other argument about the, the you know, the, the, the creeping nature of this, what, what we have done is, as the war has changed in character over the last two plus years, our support has evolved. In the beginning, they needed Stinger uh, anti-air missiles and Javelin anti-tank missiles. Now they need much more air defense uh, and long range capabilities. And we continue to provide those capabilities again as the war has changed, as Putin has changed his operational strategy. Finally, former President Trump said this morning on Fox News that the world is out of control and laid the blame on President Biden because he said world leaders don't respect President Biden. Your response? Well, I don't get into uh, election campaign rhetoric. I can't do that. I can just tell you that uh, everywhere the president goes, and he will hear this message, I have no doubt, when we go to France next week for, for the D-Day commemoration and a state visit with President Macron, as well as the G7 in Italy the week later. He'll continue to hear from American leaders, as he has heard, that they welcome American leadership on the world stage, that they appreciate the way the president has revitalized our alliances and partnerships and our networks around the world, uh, and how we have stood up to aggression, whether, whether that's Putin, whether that's what Hamas has done to the Israeli uh, people or what China and the, the tensions that China has created in the Indo-Pacific. It is widely known around the world that President Biden stands with allies and partners and stands for American leadership. And he'll hear that again, I'm sure, this week. John Kirby, thanks as always for your time. You bet.